How does somebody get into the pro wrestling business almost by accident, then become one of the most popular TV stars on the planet, and then leave the industry by suing its most powerful organization for over $100 million? And all in little over a three-year period. This is the story, well, part of the story, of Sable, the blonde knockout who became a household name at the height of WWE's Attitude Era. It's the story of a woman named Rena who grew to be beloved by fans the world over as she simultaneously drew the ire of her co-workers and became a reviled figure within WWE. Her shocking exit and the fallout that ensued threatened to blackball her from the industry where she'd made her name, but like any good wrestling storyline, there was plenty of twists and turns to come. Get ready for a few Sable bombshells. I'm Jack from Coldaholic Wrestling, and this is the true story of Sable's controversial WWE exit. Rena Marlette Greek was born on August 8, 1967 in Jacksonville, Florida. Outdoorsy and naturally athletic, Rena enjoyed gymnastics and horseback riding in her youth. She also competed in beauty pageants, winning her first one at the tender age of 12. In the mid-1980s, she met and fell in love with a man named Wayne Richardson, with the two marrying in 1987. The couple's daughter, Mariah, was born in March of 88, and while acting as a housewife and stay-at-home mother, Rena picked up a fair few modeling gigs for big brands like Pepsi and Guess. Things were, by all appearances, steady and stable for the young family. But sadly, on October 19th, 1991, Wayne Richardson died when he crashed his best friend Chevrolet Blazer into a concrete pole. Wayne and two of his friends passed away instantly, while another died in hospital two days later. Not long after the accident, police declared that Wayne was legally drunk at the time and had a blood alcohol level far above the legal limit. Wayne had been described as a wild-eyed southern boy by close friends, and his enjoyment of the party life was no secret. On the night of the crash, Wayne was apparently drowning his sorrows following an argument he and Rena had gotten into about his weekend lifestyle. It was the last time the two would ever speak. The premature death of her husband was devastating, but Rena endeavoured to carry on with her life and sought more work as a model to support herself and her daughter. It wasn't terribly long after Wayne's passing that she first met Mark Miro at a mall restaurant. The man, then better known as Johnny B. Bad, was in town for a WCW event and invited his new acquaintance to the show. They became fast friends and in time began dating before marrying in 1993. Shortly afterwards, Mark officially adopted Mariah as his own child. Rena continued to model and raise her daughter while Mark was on the road, though she certainly influenced her new husband's career and had a hand in his WCW exit. In early 1996, Mark Miro informed WCW management that he wanted to drop Kimberly Page as his manager. Citing his Christian faith, Miro told Eric Bischoff that he didn't want to be seen cavorting with another man's wife on the road, regardless of whether it was scripted or not. Bischoff, for his part, didn't want to deal with anyone who objected to what he felt was a pretty standard storyline, so he let Mark go. In the midst of a burgeoning wrestling war, Vince McMahon, a noted fan of the Johnny B. Bad character, was more than happy to snap up a new piece of talent that had just entered the free market, and the two sides immediately entered into negotiations. In one of those fortuitous moments that probably seemed like no big deal at the time, but wound up greatly impacting the lives and careers of all involved years later, Mark invited Rena to accompany him for his meeting with WWE officials. Awestruck by her beauty, McMahon and co ended up not only signing Mark to a then rare guaranteed contract, but also snapped up his wife as well. Rena, using the name Sable, made her WWE debut at WrestleMania 12, accompanying Hunter Hearst Helmsley for his match with The Ultimate Warrior. Mark also made his debut that night, his backstage interview being interrupted by a seething Helmsley who had just been completely squashed by The Returning Warrior. It didn't take a genius to see where this was all going, and sure enough, in the time that it takes to say goodbye Triple H, Sable had ditched the Greenwich snob in favour of the wild man, her real-life husband. So, husband and wife were now an on-screen as well as an off-screen item, and Sable's popularity rapidly grew with a fan base that was skewing younger and predominantly male. 
Of course, there had been female wrestlers, managers, and valets on WWE television beforehand, but Sable was presented as an object of desire in a way that nobody else really had previously. At that time, the only women of note on the WWE roster were Sable, Sonny, and Terry, three beautiful women who served as eye candy, really, and were also regularly involved in angles. And really throughout this story, it's noticeable how women in wrestling are taken far more seriously today, especially in WWE. With only a few spots available, competition for TV time was fierce, and a natural jealousy towards the newcomer led to tensions in the locker room, particularly between Sonny and Sable. Things didn't get much better when Sable supposedly stiffed her counterpart in the eye during a ringside slap fight on the September 23rd, 96 episode of Raw. Sonny was already annoyed as Mark had nixed plans for her to beat Sable up, so this didn't necessarily help things. Rena and Mark's reluctance for Sable to get involved physically would be a constant issue during their WWE stay. In those earlier days, Sable's main function was to accompany and manage her husband. Inevitably, the side dish became the main course, so to speak, in the eyes of the fans who chanted her name instead of his. The wild man character wasn't exactly being a slam dunk, so even if Miro enjoyed a nice push and captured the IC title, it was clear to everyone who the real star of the act was. In February of 97, disaster struck when Miro tore his ACL and was forced to undergo major reconstructive knee surgery. It was certainly a blow for him to suffer such a big injury less than a year into his WWE career, especially with WrestleMania right around the corner. Mark would have to sit out for the next six to eight months, but Sable continued to be featured on WWE television in segments where she would, for example, help sell merchandise. The Slammy Award winner's star continued to rise in Miro's absence, which set up a natural storyline for his return. When he came back to television proper in October, he did so with a new look and gimmick. He was now marvelous Mark Miro with an attire and style that played off his past as a Golden Gloves boxer. Resentful of Sable's success, Miro would begin a slow burn heel turn that saw him mistreat his wife, scolding her for flaunting her body while he was out convalescing. His attempts to cover up his wife's skin invariably backfired as she shed the potato sacks and reindeer costumes for even skimpier outfits. For a long time, it felt like a good chunk of WWE's creative meetings must have revolved around creating scenarios for Sable to get in a bikini or lingerie, or even less. These exploits were a big hit with the growing 18 to 34 male demographic, and she became a genuine ratings draw who, at her peak, was behind only Steve Austin in terms of bringing in viewers. Her 1998 VHS tape Sable Unleashed was second only to Stone Cold's. As far as her on-camera performances, Rena was derided in some quarters for a perceived lack of charisma or acting ability, with her detractors writing her off as only being over because of her body. But Sable certainly had the it factor, whatever it may be, and there was truth to her proclamation that she did something for the women who want to be her and the men who come to see her. As time went on and she became more and more over, Rena and Mark became more amenable to putting Sable in scenarios where physicality was involved. This included Sable's in-ring debut, which naturally was saved for pay-per-view. At WrestleMania 14, almost two years to the day since making her WWE debut, Sable teamed with Miro to defeat the artist formerly known as Goldust and Luna Vachon in a well-received mixed tag match. Considering her complete lack of experience and prior hesitancy when it came to doing anything that involved taking a bump, Sable put in a commendable performance and was duly showered with praise when she returned backstage. This reportedly upset Vachon, who didn't get as much as a thank you for helping to carry her opponent with the lights on bright, and had to be consoled by a sympathetic Owen Hart. Luna continued to have problems with Rena and Mark as the year wore on, which ended up being a deciding factor in her dismissal. Vachon envied Sable's success and was dismayed at the direction the business was going, with a focus more on looks and sex appeal than in-ring talent. As the member of a famous wrestling family who had more than paid her dues, she felt as if she had been overlooked in favor of this flavor of the month talent. The two women briefly worked alongside one another in the oddity stable before starting a feud later in the year over the women's championship, a belt which had pretty much been brought back for Sable to win at Survivor Series. It had been a banner year for the promotion in 1998, during which Sable supposedly made somewhere in the region of a quarter of a million dollars to a million dollars, uh, so good for her as well. Rena and Mark both signed three-year contract extensions with WWE in the August of that year, and that December, Sable completed her first photo shoot for Playboy magazine for a cover edition that would be released in March to coincide with the big promotional push 
for WrestleMania. Signing a lucrative deal that supposedly made her, at the time, the highest paid Playboy cover girl in history, Rena was also given full creative control over the shoot, including final say on what pictures would make it into the magazine. On the surface, everything seemed fine and dandy, but as 98 became 99, the relationship between the Miros and WWE began to unravel. The first major warning signs concerned the build-up to Sable's women's title defense against Luna at the Royal Rumble. The main bone of contention, particularly with Mark, who was very much helping to navigate his wife's career, much to the chagrin of the WWE office, was the strap match stipulation. Mark complained to talent relations chief Jim Ross, feeling it was too dangerous since Rena had never trained for it and there were no plans to do a practice session prior to the show, since Sable was so heavily booked doing personal and promotional appearances. The match was originally pulled from the show, but put back on after WWE agreed to do a walkthrough the morning of the Rumble. This was just one incident that put heat on the Miros though, as the tide of opinion was beginning to turn against them. Just a couple of weeks after the Rumble, it was reported that there was a lot of internal heat regarding Sable and that Rena and Mark had requested their releases from their recently signed three-year contracts. Their requests were turned down, mainly because WWE didn't want to lose Sable as they figured they were due a ton of exposure from her Playboy cover issue, which was due to hit shelves in early March. Also, Sable was doing some serious numbers on Raw and Sunday Night Heat and was genuinely one of the company's top draws. Her February 8th appearance on TSN's Gallagher talk show only intensified the ill will towards her. Booked alongside China and Deborah to promote that night's show at the Toronto Sky Dome, Sable and the Ninth Wonder of the World ended up working themselves into a shoot. Asked about potentially challenging for Sable's title, China dismissed the idea, claiming it would take mere seconds for her to accomplish it. Naturally, that didn't sit well with the champ, who, somewhere in her comeback, insinuated that China had some chemical assistance in getting so big and strong. When word got out to the locker room about what had happened, they largely sided with the D-Generation X member, the general feeling being that Sable crossed the line and that China's initial comments about beating her were clearly made in a worked fashion. In general, the roster and WWE management were growing tired of the Miros, who had made it clear that Rena never got into the business to be an actual wrestler. They were also dismayed about the evolution of the Sable character and wanted to really tone down the sex appeal aspect. That was slightly awkward timing with the whole Playboy shoot about to come out and everything. There was speculation that all of these issues could convince WWE management to have Sable drop the women's title to Luna at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre pay-per-view, but the match was pulled when Luna was suspended. Luna then had a backstage altercation with the Miros, which was really the straw that broke the camel's back after consistently erratic behavior, including previous confrontations with Jacqueline and road agent Blackjack Lanza. As a result of this, Vachon was released in early March, but Rena Miro didn't have time to dwell on it as she was positively swamped with commitments related to Playboy and WrestleMania. The Sable issue of Playboy was reportedly the highest selling copy of the magazine in 15 years, and Hugh Hefner's company were eager to do another one at the first opportunity. Rena was reportedly paid $150,000 for the Playboy shoot itself, as well as a small percentage of the profits, giving her a likely total payoff of more than 200 grand. WrestleMania was also a good payoff for Sable, who retained her women's title against newcomer Tori on the show. The match was poorly received, but Rena Miro wouldn't have cared a jot about that because the fact was she was in a featured title match on a show that did an 800,000 domestic buy rate. At the same time, there was a lot of chatter about Rena becoming a regular in a TV series, and she began taking acting lessons. In early April of 99, she filmed a guest spot on La Femme Nikita. To those within WWE, it was becoming increasingly obvious that she had at least one eye on Hollywood. On screen, Sable turned heel and aligned with Nicole Bass while doing everything she could to avoid actually wrestling. And that included when it came time to finally drop her title after holding onto it for six months. Rena had already rejected proposals to drop the title on TV and flat out refused to wrestle on house shows, maintaining that she never agreed to wrestle when she joined the company. She was happy to wrestle on pay-per-view because of the money involved, but didn't want to take bumps. At one point, she even claimed during a televised interview that she actually had a no bumps clause written into her contract. This clearly put WWE in a bind and led to a bizarre situation when they booked Sable to lose the title on the May 10th, 1999 episode of Raw. Before the show, she gave a handwritten contract to WWE, which said the following. 
Notwithstanding any agreement between us, and because we disagree about the fashion, I would lose my belt, and because of my concerns of humiliation and safety, it is agreed that I appear tonight solely upon your contractual assurances that I will not lose my gown nor wrestle, and that the girl with whom I am interfacing agrees with her role. My appearance in Manchester shall be no more than parading in the ring and shall not include wrestling. I agree to make a scheduled personal appearance outside the ring, otherwise I will have complete hiatus from the WWF until May 23rd, at which time we hope to have our contractual concerns resolved. Until such time, neither I nor the WWF, its employees or subcontractors shall speak disparagingly about the other, scripted or unscripted. And with that, Sable actually defeated Deborah in a short evening gown match before WWE Commissioner Shawn Michaels ruled that, in his opinion, since Deborah lost her clothes, she was actually the winner and therefore the new champion. It was a frankly ludicrous compromise to make, but Rena was agreeable to it and it got the title away from her, which is kind of what WWE management wanted in the first place. Six days later, Sable was in the United Kingdom for the UK exclusive No Mercy pay-per-view. WWE had pulled her merchandise from sale and had cancelled promotional appearances she was scheduled for following the debacle on the May 10th Raw. Due to wrestle Tory on the show, Sable instead backed out of the match, claiming the Manchester weather had given her a chest cold. Sable's bodyguard Nicole Bass took her place in the match and beat Tory in a very short bout. And that was Sable's last WWE appearance for nearly four years. When Rena and Mark returned home to Jacksonville, Florida, they discovered that an unpleasant, unwanted extra had accompanied them on their transatlantic trip when they found human excrement in their luggage. The culprit of this so-called rib was later revealed to be Sean X Pac Waltman. In early June, it was reported that Rena and Mark Miro were in the middle of a contract dispute with WWE and were not being used, but that didn't nearly begin to tell the whole story. That's because it soon came to light that Rena Miro had quit the company and filed a $140 million lawsuit against WWE's parent company, Titan Sports, on June 3rd. The lawsuit, filed in the US District Court in Bridgeport, Connecticut, was the result of months and months of disagreements between the two sides. The trouble had started in April of 98, when Sable tried to claim at least partial credit for Unforgiven's pay-per-view buy rate of 300,000, which was high for the standards of the time. She had been booked in an evening gown match against Luna on the show and felt that the possibility of her being seen in her underwear had enticed punters to part with their cash. Now that attitude, and putting herself on the same level as the top star in the industry, didn't endear herself to the wrestlers in the back, who were already annoyed at her reluctance to work all of the house shows they were expected to. The backstage ostracization of the Miros had to play a big part in their decision to ask for their releases the first time, and they, as well as some Hollywood agents, believed that Rena could be the next Pamela Anderson-esque star if she committed to Tinseltown full-time. Further problems arose in relation to Sable's planned second Playboy cover issue, which was due for an August release. WWE had actively encouraged her to pose for the first issue, rightfully believing that it would be great publicity for WrestleMania 15. Rena had initially turned down the opportunity before her amount of compensation was upped. WWE acted as brokers for the deal the first time around, but the magazine went directly to Miro on the second occasion. By contract, the deal should have been made with Jim Bell of Titan Sports acting as Rena's agent, since she would be using the WWE own name, Sable. WWE weren't necessarily bothered about getting a cut for her appearance, which would have been small change in those halcyon days when the company was just absolutely raking it in, but they were concerned about setting a precedent and protecting their intellectual property. For what it's worth, those within WWE believed Sable had been offered around $850,000 for the second centerfold, quadruple her fee for the first issue. The Miros had gone to WWE management at the May 10th television taping, the one where Sable had dropped the women's title, and requested a release. WWE were happy to grant Mark his, since they hadn't used him in months and frankly saw him as being a nuisance when it came to dealing with his wife, but Sable would have a non-compete preventing her from working anywhere else in wrestling until August of 2001, as well as using the name Sable in film and television. Because of her incredible popularity and marketability at the time, reflected in her effect on WWE's ratings, as well as the ratings for her appearance on Pacific Blue, Rena had no shortage of offers coming in from the wider entertainment industry. As for the 24-page lawsuit itself, she leveled various claims against WWE, including that they had repeatedly requested for her breasts to become fully exposed on television in a scripted accident, despite her saying no every time. 
She further alleged that she had signed her contract extension under duress, that male members of the WWE roster would frequently walk into the women's locker room as if by accident, that WWE wanted her to do a lesbian angle, that wrestlers had threatened her during steroid-induced rages, that the company didn't provide an accurate picture of her merchandise sales, and... Well, there was a lot there, but the basic gist was that she felt she had been lied to about several things, was being prevented from pursuing an acting career, and the WWE was an unsafe and morally objectionable working environment. Industry commentators felt that some parts of the suit had merit, while other parts were ridiculous, and that the $140 million figure she was seeking was really just a tactic to get her release, along with the rights to use the Sable name. Days after the lawsuit became public knowledge, Rina Miro did the unthinkable and showed up on the live broadcast of WCW Nitro. Seated in the front row, Miro smiled and waved at the camera while being shown in close-up. WCW's announced team, including Eric Bischoff, made a point not to reference her either as Sable or Rina Miro, but the fans were more than happy to chant her WWE-owned moniker. Alarm bells were ringing in Titan Towers when they saw one of their contracted performers popping up on the rival show's TV program. In spite of Rina Miro's desire to obtain her full release, she was still technically under WWE contract at the time she appeared on Nitro, and Titan lawyers smelled a breach. WWE had sent Rina a cease and desist the week before, asking her to stop using the name Sable. When it came to the Nitro appearance, Rena innocently claimed that she had just been in Chicago visiting a friend, noticed that the wrestling was in town, and bought a ticket of her own volition. WCW corroborated the story, but in actuality, Kevin Nash had acted as an intermediary and made sure with Turner Broadcasting's legal department that Rena showing up wouldn't cause any issues for either her or the company. WWE's ace lawyer, Jerry McDevitt, immediately contacted WCW's attorneys and threatened to file a lawsuit. WCW contended that Rena Miro slash Sable was not negotiating with the company and would not appear on WCW programming until her contract expired in August of 2001, so good luck with that one, or she had obtained a full release. Speaking to the media, McDevitt vowed that Miro would never get the rights to the Sable name and could, quote, sue until the cows come home. Rena herself used the media, including an appearance on The Jay Leno Show, to attack the wrestling business for being unregulated, sleazy, and violent. She also filmed commercials and infomercials and fielded TV and movie scripts while waiting to see how the lawsuit would play out. On July 12th, a little over a month after filing the suit, a court in New Haven, Connecticut ruled that the name Sable was the intellectual property of Titan Sports. Once that had been decided, the two sides quickly began working out the deals of a settlement. Not so much with a general payout, but the financial aspect of Miro's deal with Playboy, future royalties, and the terms of release for both her and Mark. The lawsuit was officially settled out of court on July 22nd, with both Rena and WWE agreeing to not discuss the matter in public, nor disclose the terms of the settlement. Mark Miro got his full contractual release, while Rena was bound to the original terms of hers, meaning she couldn't work for WWE's competition until August of 2001. Rena may not have been able to use the name Sable, but Playboy reportedly negotiated with WWE to use it for the August issue of their magazine. They also announced a bumper Ultimate Sable edition of the magazine for October, making her the first woman to be on the cover of Playboy three times in a calendar year. I say reportedly agreed because Jerry McDevitt told the media in September that they had not reached a full agreement before the August issue went to print and they were suing Playboy for some of the issue's profits, as well as attempting to block the forthcoming 96-page special. The saga did go through the court system, but to cut a long and quite frankly tedious story short, they sorted things out and WWE and Playboy's relationship only continued to grow in the years after, with stars like China, Tori Wilson, and Maria Kanellis posing for the magazine. Her WWE career ostensibly over, Rena Miro pretty much relocated to Los Angeles to try and get her fledgling Hollywood career up and running. She received some small parts in movies and TV shows and got an offer to write an autobiography, which was never published, but without the WWE marketing machine behind her, Miro's star began to wane. In December of 2000, Jim Ross noted during a conference call that he'd had conversations with the Miros regarding a potential return, but that the timing wasn't right and that there were still hard feelings stemming from her acrimonious exit. In November of 2001, Rena resurfaced in wrestling as the heel CEO of the short-lived XWF, but was only around for one set of TV tapings as the promotion never really got off the ground. Her name came up again in September of 2002 when she testified in the trial between WWE and her former 
former on-screen bodyguard Nicole Bass, who had sued the company citing sexual harassment. Miro testified that Vince McMahon had broken his promise to portray Sable as a classy, intellectual woman, and that she had left after refusing to bear her breasts on TV or participate in a lesbian storyline. You might assume that testifying against the company on behalf of somebody attempting to sue them for millions, which was ultimately ruled in favor of WWE, I might add, could further block any attempts from Miro to get back into the business. Rena had talks with the insurgent NWA TNA in early 2003, but instead shocked the world by returning to the WWE on the April 3rd, 2003 episode of SmackDown. Never say never, I guess. She had called WWE to see if there was interest and the company had subsequently flown to Los Angeles to negotiate with her, hammering out the details in a single sitting. Signing a multi-year deal, WWE assured her that what happened in the past would stay in the past. However, according to husband Mark, Rena did have to apologize to some of the top ranking members of the locker room she'd rubbed the wrong way during her first run, including Steve Austin and The Undertaker. And what are the odds that two of the first things she would be asked to do were a lesbian angle with Tori Wilson and a romance with Mr. McMahon? Some honestly might call it a punishment of sorts. On the home front, just two months after Sable's return, it was reported that Rena and Mark Miro had gotten a separation. It came out later that the cause of the split was Rena's affair with Brock Lesnar. Mark was beside himself when suspicions of on-the-road adultery were confirmed via a voicemail message, but quickly found the meaning of forgiveness when Rena told him that the voice belonged to the next big thing. It wasn't only Brock that got on well with Sable backstage, and by all accounts, she was a pleasure to deal with around this time, even if she did have a major blowout with Wilson after months of them working together, but that situation was quickly resolved. Sable and Tori graced another Playboy cover together in the annual WrestleMania tie-in feature, which also bagged them a tag team evening gown match at the showcase of the Immortals. It became apparent after that promotional push that the creative team might be struggling for ideas when it came to the former women's champion, and after returning from a layoff caused by a punctured breast implant, her role was significantly lessened. It didn't help that Brock had left WWE immediately after WrestleMania 20 to pursue a pro football career, which made Sable's position tenuous at best. Not that Rena seemed to care, as she continued to speak freely against the company line. In an interview published in the August 8th edition of the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette, Sable made a lot of interesting comments. She said that women were hired on looks, not ability, which she admitted benefiting from. She claimed that women with talent were overlooked because they didn't have a particular appearance, argued that women were judged more harshly than men, especially if they had kids and went out on the road, and noted that women were not part of the management structure in WWE, among other things. The news of her release two days after that interview did the rounds was hardly the surprise of the century. Century, although apparently the parting of ways was said to be amicable. Rena had asked for an easier schedule so that she could be at home with her teenage daughter more, whereas WWE wanted her to work more of the house shows because she didn't have a substantial role on TV at the time. It has now been almost 20 years since we've seen Sable on WWE programming as she has remained out of the spotlight. Not that she ever has to worry about work, of course, given that she's married to Brock Lesnar, one of the highest paid WWE superstars ever. Together, they live in rural Canada and raise their sons, Turk and Duke. Public sightings of Rena are rare, and most fans only caught glimpses of her when Brock fought in the UFC. Rena does not make public appearances and is not signed to a WWE Legends deal, and according to Tori Wilson, when she was inducted to the Hall of Fame, WWE didn't even want Sable's name mentioned. Not because of any bad blood, but because Rena Miro is happy living a quiet, normal, and private life. Hey, 1999 was a long time ago.